Welcome, friends, and sorry for the delay in getting started this evening. But this is Ask Prof. Wolf, a program developed by Democracy at Work to allow for an interchange between you and me so that I can understand better the issues that are on your mind and you can get some answers from me that hopefully will go some way uh, to resolving or responding to issues that you want clarified. We do this every two weeks, so I will be doing it this evening and again on March 20th, two weeks from this evening. And here's how we work it. We start by having picked two questions that came in during the interval from our last uh, show of Ask Prof. Wolf. Uh, and I begin with those, and then we open it up to you to write in your questions, and we will pick among them uh, and respond as best we can. Please understand we get many more questions both between programs and in these live shows uh, than we could possibly answer. We have to choose. We don't have much time in which to do it. Uh, and bear with us. We do the best job uh, that we can. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let me jump right in. Our first question comes from Justin. And Justin asks, we understand that capitalism is exploitative in the workplace. But does the exploitation there carry over to the home life, and particularly in regards to children? The hierarchical structure of families limits these days the autonomy of children to truly be themselves. Would socialism foster more freedom and respect for children? Well, there are a number of questions buried in this very interesting question from Justin. Let me talk first about exploitation in the workplace and at home. And let me begin by reminding everyone that the concept, the definition of exploitation that I use is one that I get from Karl Marx. He did the work 150 years plus ago to define that in a rigorous scientific kind of way. And that's a much better way than using it in a loose general way. Many people talk about exploitation as kind of mistreating other people, exploiting a situation or a person or a vulnerability. Marx didn't object to any of that, of course, but he used the term in a more precise way, and here's what he meant. When one group of people produce more for another group than they get in exchange— then that's exploitation. And so I'll give you a simple example from capitalism, which is an exploitative system. When you go looking for a job, and this has happened, I'm sure, to millions of you. When you go looking for a job, you sit down with the employer, and you discuss the work to be done and the conditions, and then eventually you get to the question of how much are you going to get paid. And let's assume, just for simplicity, that the employer says, I'm going to pay you $20 an hour. Uh, and you say, okay, I'll take $20 an hour. Marx says that the only way that the employer will ever give you $20 is if what you give to the employer, the extra quantity or the better quality of output your labor helps to produce— that has to be worth to the employer because he's going to sell it after you've finished producing it. He's going to sell it, and he's going to want that extra to bring him more than $20 because if the extra your labor gives to him, better quality or greater quantity, if what that fetches in the market is $20 and that's what he gets, and then he turns around and gives you the 20 because you did the work, what's left in it for him? Nothing not going to do it. He's only going to hire you and every other worker if the extra produced by that worker's labor is more, more than what is paid to that labor as a wage or a salary. That means that worker is exploited. Employers exploit employees has nothing to do with whether they treat them politely or not, in a friendly way, in a cruel way, in a deferring way. Th those are important questions, but it's not about exploitation. 
exploitation is crucial in capitalism because what the workers produce for the employer being more than what the employer pays them, therein lies the profit. That's what businesses are in business to get. So exploitation exists in the workplace. Could it exist at home? And the answer, given by history a thousand times, is an emphatic yes. In households run by men, it has often been the case that women are exploited. They are made to produce more than they are given to live with. And the same applies to children. Maybe not when they're infants, but when they get to be five, six, or seven years of age, they can work inside the home or the parents can arrange for them to work outside the home. The first 150 years of American history are full of efforts of parents in the United States to stop the exploitation of their children in the workplace because hiring young children was legal and widespread in the origins of American capitalism. So you have to be very careful to remember that exploitation can happen at home or on the job. The question to ask is somebody producing more for somebody else than they are being paid to do that work of production? Now the question of socialists and children. I have to begin answering this in the normal way. Socialists is a very large word. It encompasses lots of different points of view. There is no the socialist position. The Chinese today call themselves socialists. Almost every, part, uh, every country in Europe has a socialist party, many of them very strong, very powerful. Many of them have been in governments. R Soviet Union was another kind of socialism. So there are different kinds of socialism, and they have different ways of handling many questions, including the autonomy of children. But I will say this for you. Socialists have been disproportionately among those who have argued that the conventional, traditional, authoritarian family, father at the top, mother subordinate, children subordinate again, that this is a recipe for people not developing independence, not developing self-confidence, not developing the autonomy to explore and discover who they are, which I think is the philosophy behind Justin's question. So yes, I think socialists would give you a better chance to look for and find ways to raise children in new and better ways. And I would recommend three writers that come to my mind that have talked about this. One is Russian. Makarenko was his name. And he became famous immediately after the Russian Revolution at the end of World War I, when there were thousands and thousands of orphan children because their parents had been lost in World War I, either through military conflict or death of civilians. And what was to be done with all of these orphan children? Makarenko developed schools in which they developed the collective spirit that I think a person with Justin's concerns might find very interesting. Anton Makarenko. The next one is a famous Latin American educator, Paulo Freire by name, who had also ideas about education and raising children. And then there's the American John Dewey, a professed socialist, by the way, who also had ideas about how you develop independence, critical thinking in young people. We're not doing a great job of that in the United States today, to say the least. So exploring what socialists have thought and done about that would be a good way forward. And thank you, Justin, for your question. The next question that came in over the last couple of weeks came from Karan, and I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly. Karan has two questions. The first one is, what exactly is intersectionality? In other words, how do other struggles against oppression 
are, how are they intertwined with class struggle? Okay, my answer to that is, first of all, class struggle is what I mean about exploitation. A class struggle is when the people who are producing more than they are getting, the employees fight against being in that situation. They either want more wages for the work they do, or they don't want to be in a position of producing more for somebody else in the first place. It's not that they're quarreling about how much more. They don't want the whole thing. Okay, that's the class struggle. How does it interact with others? Well, the class struggle in many ways provokes, supports, encourages, aggravates other kinds of struggle. Excuse me, struggle over race, struggle over gender, struggle over poverty and wealth. Those are all important parts of our lives and class struggles impact them. Just like struggles over race, over class, over gender, over wealth impact the class struggle. Intersectionality means they intersect these struggles. They influence, shape each other. Once upon a time, particularly on the left, people argued which is the more important. They don't do that much anymore and I'm grateful about that, because you can't quantify. There is no more or less. There are different ways people interact with one another that are oppressive or exploitative. And we don't have to measure them along some quantitative uh, scale. Let me give you an example. If you have an, uh, an exploitative class structure, a slave producing for a master, a serf producing for a lord, an employee in capitalism producing for an employer, which means that the slave, the serf, the employee are producing more for the master, the lord, or the employer than they are getting. You have exploitation. What often happens is that the employer understands that there are relatively few employers relative to the number of employees, which makes them vulnerable. So they need to develop among the employees distractions, ways of thinking that will prevent them from getting together to fix or change their exploitative situation. Race and gender are wonderful ways They've been used over and over again. Make people think there's a really important difference in the color of your skin or in the nature of your reproductive system. Set up hierarchies where white dominates black, male dominates female. Divide working people. Create tensions and conflicts between them because dividing, it's either easier to conquer the employer is safer. And so employers have always, throughout history, shown themselves able and willing to promote, support, or look the other way to racial discrimination, gender discrimination, and so on. So intersectionality is how they shape one another, and the influence goes both ways. Second part of Karan's question asks me to talk about scientific socialism in quotation marks and what it means. Well, I think this has been very badly misunderstood. It all dates back to a very famous pamphlet published in the middle of the 19th century by Karl Marx's associated uh, friend and co-editor and co-writer, Frederick Engels. And he wrote a pamphlet called Socialism, colon, Utopian or Scientific. And he created, therefore, this notion that there are different kinds of socialism. What did he mean? Utopian socialism for him was popular in those days, in the early 19th century. People were doing experiments like Robert Owen in England, setting up model factories, model 
office buildings, where relationships among people would be what socialists thought of as where they were hoping society would go. The French, Saint-Simon and Fourier, two great writers in France, were also famous for painting beautiful pictures with words about the kind of socialist future they foresaw and hoped to see. Marx was critical with Engels about this. He felt that you would never get to socialism by painting however the beautiful the picture was of what a socialist society might be. They wanted socialists to focus rather on what's exactly happening in the capitalist society. What are the conflicts, the tensions, the developments happening so that socialists could see how the system worked to nudge it in those directions that might give us socialism. They wanted scientifically, I'm going to use Marx's and Engels' language, they wanted scientifically to understand the laws of motion of the society. You know, like an astronomer wants to study the laws of motion of planets, or a biologist wants to understand the laws of the motion of the blood as it goes through the body of an animal. He wanted to, Marx and Engels, they wanted to understand how capitalism works in order to figure out who is likely to be critical of capitalism, who could be organized to push against it. What would such organized people do to move the society there? To answer those questions, you needed to have a scientific study of society, and that's what Marx gave himself as the task. And if you ever have, as I urge you to do, the opportunity to read Marx's great three-volume work, Das Kapital, Capital, you'll see that's what he does. It's a study of the laws of motion of capitalism by a scientifically oriented thinker whose goal is to understand the system in order to do better than it, to go beyond it. That's what scientific socialism is. Where I would disagree a little bit with Engels and Marx is I think they overdid it on the critique. There is a place for and a value of utopian dreaming. We all do that. People on the right, people on the left, and people in the middle. We paint pictures in our minds. We go to films that do it. We read poems that do it. We need ideas, images, dreams that we can aim for. It's part of being human, and it's part of the revolutionary process, and always was. All right, now we're going to turn to questions that are coming in already. Thank you for them. Now let me begin by thanking you. They're coming in at quite a clip, and we'll be picking them as best we can, and I will re be uh, responding. Here comes the first one from Joni. What other options are there to fix our economic system in addition to what Keynes proposed at Bretton Woods? Something else from surplus recycling or bank arrangement, asking as a socialist, says Joni. Well, what Keynes is mostly famous for and what Keynes would have said about himself. And just in case you're wondering, Keynes was crystal clearly not a socialist, did not like socialists, communists, or Marxists, had little to do with them, uh, felt that capitalism was the best system, but was able and willing, and thinks he was living in, through the Great Depression, you can see why, he was able and willing to say that capitalism had major flaws that were so serious that the, if they could bring the system down. And he, Keynes, committed himself as a leading intellectual, a professor of economics at Cambridge University in Britain. He committed himself, he was a practically active person as well as an academic, uh, to fixing capitalism, figuring out how to make capitalism work better than it was, as I say, in the midst of the Great Depression, when he wrote his famous book, The General Theory. 
What Keynes wanted to do can be rendered this way. The private capitalist sector, corporations, labor unions, individual workers, consuming families, if that's your economy, a private economy, you're going to have terrible flaws, failures, breakdowns, crashes in capitalism. And Keynes pointed to the 200 years before him during which capitalism displayed all of those things over and over and over again. So they came to be called the business cycle because they kept coming back and back. Crashes, panics, inflations, depressions. The solution Keynes said was you have to scientifically examine it, like Marx, to figure out how to make it work better. Not to go beyond it, that's Marx, but to fix it, to make it go better. And Keynes' solution was very carefully crafted to show what the government can do, what the government should do, not to displace capitalism, not to go beyond it, none of that, but to fix it, to make the private system work better. And he came up with two basic ideas. One, that the government can and should manipulate the monetary system, controlling the quantity of money in circulation and the rate of interest that people have to pay if they borrow money, businesses, individuals, and so on. And those things are called monetary policy. And the other thing Keynes said is that the government use its system of taxing individuals and businesses and spending a lot of money for defense, for public health, for roads, for highways, but to be aware that it could use its tax and spend power like it could use its monetary power to fix capitalism. And he prescribed how to do it, okay? Uh, one option of our capitalist system one that's been used very heavily ever since Keynes' writing, which is just shy of a century now, used everywhere in the world, has been to deploy monetary and fiscal policy. Every country has a central bank which does the monetary part of the job. And every country has a government that taxes and spends. And all of the people who do that study Keynesian economics and more or less use it. All of them. That's only a degree of difference. Those who call themselves conservatives are often critical of Keynes, but they use a good bit of it too. The Marxian approach, or for the socialist approach, really is fundamentally different. The socialist perspective, as I understand it, and there's a range of them, there's not just one, as I said earlier, the socialist perspective asks a question Keynesians do not ask, which is, really ought we to fix this system again? Or maybe the best way to respond to the failures of capitalism is to change the system. And here I use a metaphor that I find quite clarifying. Imagine you have an old refrigerator. The old refrigerator is capitalism. And it goes on the clink. It, it breaks down. And you get the refrigerator repair person come to your home. And they fix it. And then three months later, huh, it breaks again. They come again and fix it. And this happens over and over. Finally, there's that fateful moment you knew it was coming. When the repair person turns to you and says, look, this is the nth time I've been here this year. This refrigerator is too far gone. Too many problems have developed over too long a time. I advise you, I'll fix it if you want, but it's going to break down again. And it's going to break down worse each time. So I advise you, get rid of this refrigerator, get a new one. Socialists are a little bit like the people who are telling us, and we ought to listen in my judgment, it's time. 
capitalism, particularly that in the West, United States, Western Europe, Canada, Japan. That kind of capitalism, mostly private, minimizing the government, although, of course, using the government, that has accumulated too many problems. It has had too many failures. It's not just the Great Depression of the 1930s. It's the rough equivalent that we've had now three crashes in our new century, the 21st century. The dot-com crash in 2000, the subprime mortgage crash in 2008, and now the COVID crash in 2020, 2021. Three crashes and the last two among the worst in the history of capitalism. It's too many difficulties. It's too hard. We ought to at least engage a national conversation on just the question that Joni raises. Maybe we've come to the time where at very least we ought not just to ask one more fix, like the repair of the refrigerator, or maybe the change of the system, and what would that look like, and where would that go? Let's have the courage to do that would be a rational response, I think, to where we are. The next question comes from Colin. And here's what Colin says. Germany is releasing a study on the impact of missed work from sick days, a record there in 2023. How do I think the impacts of the ongoing COVID pandemic and more than one and a half million dead impact the U.S. or impact us here in the United States? That's a very interesting question. And I think the impacts are enormous and that they've only begun. We may think that the COVID, the worst of COVID at least, is behind us. And maybe in terms of death, and illness, it is. But vast changes were produced by that plague, and they ought to be respected. Yes, there are days missed from work, and those are very, very important. And they are an indictment, particularly here in the United States, of a failed medical care system. We are one of the richest countries in the world. We thought we had a highly developed modern medical system, but we suffered a disproportionate number of deaths and illnesses in COVID. That's not a successful performance. When you add the economic fact that Americans spend more money on health care than any other people on earth, in terms of dollars per citizen, so it's adjusted for the size of the country, then it becomes intolerable that we spend more than everybody else, we're a richer country, a more developed medical system, and we suffered more COVID deaths. So yeah, it, it's outrageous. And, and the effects, of course, on all the families is incalculable, but it goes way beyond missed work days. Here, I'll give you a few examples. A huge number of people cannot and will not go back to work at a workplace. They want to work from home, remotely, as we call it. Okay, this has an enormous set of consequences. Transportation that used to be paid for by riders moving from home to job, that transportation is losing money because the riders aren't making the ride. They're doing the work from home. Who's going to deal with the economics of transportation? Here's another one. We have a crisis barely kept under control in what's called commercial real estate. Here's what that means. Our cities and towns are full right now, as I speak with you, of empty offices, offices that cannot and will not be rented, haven't been rented since COVID hit, which is now a year or two behind us. The landlords cannot rent those places because people are working from home. People don't want to come to the office. And the companies, therefore, don't need the rented space 
for their desks and their cubicles where people worked. And because all of these commercial office buildings, or nearly all of them, were built by money borrowed by the builder from a bank, the builder is telling the banks, we can't repay our loans because we don't have any rents coming in. And there's a serious question right now whether we're going to have a failure of the banks that are most heavily lent into commercial real estate. Then there are the harder to estimate. Here's something. In many places, schools were closed, as I'm sure you know. Young people's education was interrupted. Those who had a lot of money could go home, get a tutor, use their computers, but millions of Americans did not have the money for a tutor. Probably many millions didn't have the money for a computer. And even if they did, the parents were busy working out of the house and could not monitor the children to make sure that they made use of the, you get the picture. It'll take decades to figure out the damage to the productivity of the American labor force because of the interrupted education. And because my wife is a psychotherapist and teaches me about psychology, I understand that her patients have taught her the consequences, the way their lives were shaken up by not having a job to go to, by being worried about their health, by wondering whether they even have a future. So yeah, the impact of a failure to deal with a health crisis, it costs way more, way more than it would have cost to have a proper health care system. For example, one that guarantees health care to everybody, which is what every other industrial country beside the United States, even Canada and Mexico have it, we don't. And we pay an enormous price. It may be profitable for the doctors and the hospitals and the drug and device makers and the medical insurers. They may be getting a lot of money. But in terms of health care and the rationality of what the costs of it are, you've asked a crucial question, and the answer should teach us a lesson. Spend money now to take care of your people. It will pay you back many times over, and that's what the pandemic should have taught us. The next question comes from Hagangs. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Have you been asked by any current American politicians to advise them on economics and public policy that can improve the lives of Americans? How can we achieve this improvement? Well, it's very sweet of you to ask that question. Uh, to tell you the truth, yes, the answer is, I have been. However, because this is America, and, and think about what this means that I have to answer you this way. Because of this being America, and because of the reputation I have as being a critic of capitalism, I cannot tell you who the politicians were and are who have asked me for my advice. But there have been a nice group of them. Nice people, good people. I did what I could to answer the questions and to provide the advice uh, that they sought. Let me tell you a further thing. Um, many more people understand that the problems of American capitalism now are greater than they have ever been, more resistant to the conventional solutions than they have ever been, and in urgent need of the attention of people from all persuasions so that we can have all the input to solving them that we could possibly make use of. There are many more who think that and know that than are daring to say so. That's a flaw in this system, that we have made it difficult and awkward and dangerous for people to talk honestly so instead, we have politicians who fall all over themselves to flatter the voters, 
to say everything is okay or to promise if only you elect them, they'll make it all okay without ever telling you quite how they're going to do it because, of course, they can't. And since we now know who the people are running for president in the United States, let me answer this question by referring to them. Mr. Trump was president for four years. The inequality of the American system, the gap between rich and poor, got worse under Mr. Trump. And afterwards, with Mr. Biden, it got worse again. No big difference. Mr. Trump gave bigger tax breaks to business than Mr. Biden. Mr. Biden, for his part, gleefully took us into two wars, one in Ukraine and one in Israel, Gaza. Yes, I know we are not directly involved, but we are paying for them and we are funding them and we are shipping them very expensive weapons. These are presidents who have made many of our problems worse, not better, both of them. And for anyone to say that America can't come up with better than these two old white men is insulting the American people and American society because we all know that that's not true. The next question, what is your opinion about workers' council from the tradition of Panacook and Gorder? Uh, the people named, Panacook in particular, are old, uh, in Panacook's ca uh, case, uh, Dutch or Netherlands uh, Marxists from some years ago. Workers' Council uh, is an idea I associated in my mind, particularly with the Italian Marxist leader Antonio Gramsci, who advocated councils of workers in every workplace as being the best way to mobilize and organize the working class to confront the employer class that workers' councils would be training grounds where workers would learn not to do the particular task they were hired to, but to aspire to something bigger, a new society, a new world, a new way to organize the workplace, to be, if I dare use the word, a vanguard, to be the people who lead us into a better system than capitalism. His name were worker councils, but in a, in a the working class to say So workers' councils, and again, my apology, we're, we're believing that the weather uh, here in New York, where we are broadcasting this from, is very violent outside. And so that, that may explain a couple of the glitches that we're having. Please bear with us. So the workers' councils have been these ideas by people who want to go beyond capitalism, who think we can do better, but they're looking for how. How do we bring the working class its fears, its needs, its objections, its dreams, yes, even its utopian hopes, into play to make them part of the political change and developing groups in every workplace of those workers who can see that, who want to participate in that, that is a way forward. We are sorry, but due to connectivity issues to the weather, we have to end the show at this point earlier than we normally do. Our apologies. We will see you again in two weeks on the 20th of March, where we anticipate none of these problems at all. Thank you for your understanding.